for those of you who might not be familiar with Aperture, Aperture is a nonprofit organization founded in 1952 by a group of artists, writers, and curators as a common ground for photography. Today, Aperture is a multi-platform publisher that unites the photography community in print, in person, and online. Aperture's programs are made possible by the generosity of our board of trustees, our members, and other individuals, and in part by the New York State Legislature. This past year, as part of a series that started in 2020 called Creating Stories for Tomorrow, Aperture and Fujifilm commissioned a group of emerging photographers to create a new body of work in response to the question, what does tomorrow look like? These artists were given a commissioning fee and Fujifilm cameras with which they made their projects. They each worked with an editor at Aperture to develop a brief, edit their work into a portfolio, and craft a narrative around a project. You can find all of the stories uh, published on Aperture.org together with essays by a group of wonderful writers complimenting the artist's work. I would like to thank my colleagues, Cassidy Paul, Aperture Digital Editor, and Varun Nayar, Associate Managing Editor, who have worked with the artists over the past several months and have um, produced amazing stories, um, as well as our colleagues Alex Schlechter and Brianna Rettig for organizing today's program. We also extend our sincere, sincerest thanks to our partners at Fujifilm, who gave us the artistic freedom and editorial independence to craft exciting visual stories, and crucially, to provide a unique platform to a group of immensely talented artists. So if you have questions um, at the end of today's program, please feel free to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your frame and we will get to them. We're hoping to have a very dynamic conversation with a wonderful group of um, photographers. So yes, please remember to add any questions you might have at the end. So we're going to introduce each of the photographers um, one at a time and they will in turn take us through their commission. Um, we'll show some pictures, um, learn about their work, and then we will all um, join together for a conversation about um, this project. So I would first like to invite Ashish Shah to um, join us on camera, and I will share my screen and show his work. So just bear with us one second. Hello, Brendan. How are you? Hello. So nice to see you. And so nice to see you. You're calling in from Bombay, Mumbai. sorry, yeah. from, from yeah. Mumbai, yeah, yeah. Uh, late at night. Um, Ashish, we had the pleasure of working together um, a few years ago on a portrait commission for Aperture Magazine's Delhi issue, um, and that's how this creative relationship began, and it was um, great to work with you on a project that is slightly at an angle from how you normally work, which is um, often in the fashion context and working with clients such as Alexander McQueen, Vogue India, Raw Mango and others and developing a signature fashion um, photography style and a way of working in that space that's really, really special. So um, when we reached out to you about this project, um, you had a very um, surprising and exciting idea about going to a region of India that was your home region and to um, look at the idea of um, depopulation and people leaving villages um, to come to the city and what um, the villages look like, what those regions look like um, when people leave. So I uh, would invite you to tell us a little bit about how you got the idea for this project and what it was like to travel to these spaces and, and make this work and maybe a little bit about what you learned the course of this commission. And I'll just go through the slides here, but if you would like to stop on any one particular image, um, please let me know. I mean, I started as a portrait and fashion photographer and uh, I moved from um, my town to the big city, Delhi, and wanting to make a living in photography. And it's been almost eight, 10 years now I'm working as a photographer. And for the longest, I had this idea of making pictures in my hometown, but it was sort of a love and hate relationship with my hometown. And it took me a lot of years to make peace with it. And over the years, I realized I'm, I'm part of the same shift. I mean, I'm somebody who was living in, in this town and then I moved to Delhi and then Mumbai and now traveling here and there. And while my ancestral village 
uh-huh. there's no one lives in that ancestral village and my dad has forever been like we should go back there we should spend some time in that hometown but right now i mean honestly nobody in my family or me we all have our lives careers and everything and nobody is in that mindset to go back to the to the village and you know live a life there so this is one of the stories which is very close to me and i and i wanted the story to come from more of a lived in experience and uh, i mean there are, there is a lot happening around and as a photographer there are so many stories but my i wanted especially for aperture i wanted the story to come more from a lived in experience something that i personally experienced and if and a project that i can relate to so, so when i'm making pictures i could relate to the moments for example if somebody is waiting for a bus i i lived that life or probably seeing somebody's house in the village where nobody is living right now i i mean me and my parents we we are going through the same experience right now so that's why i wanted to talk about this story and my entire state is going through this i mean like how um, definition of growth and career is different for everyone right now so a lot of people in the small towns are moving to big cities for example like how i moved from my hometown to a big city and uh, so that's why i decided to work on this story which is about the ghost villages in pori and i pori is one of the state one of the town which is the most affected towns right now when it comes to people moving to different to the big cities is this a phenomenon that has been over the last 10 years over the last 30 years like what would you describe as the moment when things began shifting and people were leaving um the villages i feel uh, i mean i i think social media plays a major role here in last eight ten years and a lot of people are moving now so for example we living in big cities are really trying to avoid fast fashion while my sisters in my in my hometown go crazy when it comes to you know this fast fashion brand and they want to order everything and I, and every time i go back to my hometown i like no you shouldn't do this this is not right this is not wrong but the thing is that i've already been through that and these small towns are going through that right now so i think it has really increased in last 5 7 years did you have a um a guide in in these spaces i mean i feel like you probably know the village as well but on the other hand did you need yeah did, to help did you have an assistant did you have someone like moving through these uh areas with you as you made the project so i wanted to travel with locals also i i like to I mean I I like the idea to uh, to travel for my pictures rather than just uh, and and exploring what's happening around for example especially this picture now we we were figuring it figuring out our own stuff you know maybe looking for a place to have a tea or something and then then I ended up seeing this whole moment happening in front of me wherein this woman is there you know her her son was moving to a big city and then she was just there and while the car was leaving with her son in the car she was just looking at the car and with full teary eyes so and then the the beautiful part about this story is i found a local who was traveling with me lakpati prasad who's in one of the pictures we go to the next slide mm-hmm. oh i think he's on the left is that right hey. yeah on the left on the left yeah so uh so this guy this guy was with, with his family was living in in a slightly bigger town and and he wasn't really happy with what was happening and then he left everything his government job and everything just wanting to make things better in his village and he happened to be my guide and then he showed me also the best person to show me around and he he took me to almost every village and and giving me an insight how how everyone thinks of him as as a fool who who left a proper job in the big city and has come back to the you know to the village and and while he's in the village is trying to grow apples and you know he, he wants to make sure that there's no one who no one throws garbage here and there but at the same time i mean he doesn't get much acceptance so and and i felt like it just happened accidentally and then I felt like I mean he's probably one of the most important person to talk about. 
And then I remember when you sent in these pictures, I thought I recognized them instantly, meaning I recognize your style, the way people are posed and, and the lighting. Can you tell us about the 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 young man on the right with um who I think is like waiting to go to school? Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So his name is Anu. And while we were going to one of the villages and he asked us for a lift and he was like, can you drop me a little ahead? And so I, I was talking to him and I, and I, I uh, during my conversation with him, I figured out that this, this boy, he travels almost five kilometers. I don't know how much that is in miles, but uh, every day to school and then, and then he goes back five miles just to get the basic education. I mean, mm -hmm. he's not, it's, it's not a fancy college he wants. He just wants to be a graduate. And that's the day-to-day -day struggle that he's going through. Mm -hmm. So a lot of pictures, in fact, almost every picture happened to us. Like even, I, even if I like to go to a place to look for pictures, I, I absolutely love when pictures happen to me. Instead of me going with the mindset and then, okay, there is this tree and there will be people sitting next to the, the tree and I'll make some picture around that. I mean, I'll always go with a certain notion. However, I absolutely enjoy when the pictures happens to you. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we'll pause there and move on to the next artist, but I have a number of questions about this um, as we come back, including what you learned through the process of this um, journey back home and um, also the creation of this photo essay. But hold that question in your mind and we'll come back to it um, in just a moment. Um, I'd now like to invite um, Annabelle to join us, please. Hello. Hi, um, and Annabelle is joining us from Chicago, on the other side of the world. Um, Annabelle is a photographer from New Jersey and her photographs um, blur the limits of reality, finding drama within the mundane. Um, and she's a recent graduate from the Yale School of Art in 2022, um, where she had an MFA in photography um, and lives in Queens, but as right now, um, an artist on the road um, who may be making new work on, on a new adventure. So Annabelle, can you tell us a little bit about um, your work in general and then your thinking around this um, particular commission and how all these pictures came together to form one story? Yeah, sure. So the project was introduced to me when I was graduating uh, a pretty intense MFA program. I was at Yale for two years studying photography and um, I got this email right as I graduated and I was moving and I was in this time of transition um, after being accepted into a program before the pandemic hit and then spending the first year in um, like remotely still in New Haven and still having um, being in the studios and having a lot of interaction with my classmates, but not much out of that. And I was in a very tight knit group of um, photographers who were making work in this pretty restricted way. Um, and also kind of making work while we felt like things were kind of crumbling and things were changing. And it, it was kind of this like end of world feeling. Um, but there was a lot of hope in the community that we made together. Um, and so I was leaving that and I was moving to another city. I was moving to New York and I, I got this camera, the, the Fuji, and I started making work in a different way than I had been. And I was kind of wandering. I felt a little bit isolated um, and it wasn't really working. Like it wasn't working for me. I didn't feel like I was getting what I wanted. And I, I felt like I was in search of something, but I wasn't, I wasn't so sure what that was. Um, and so I kind of changed the way I was working and I started working with friends and um, strangers sometimes and family members. And um, I was having a lot of these conversations where I noticed that people, people were feeling um, 
they're feeling there's this like energy for change, but also this kind of exhaustion and this kind of like hopelessness. And I was reading a lot and I was reading this book, uh, Delgren, where uh, part of it, there's an astronaut and he comes, it's a very strange book. It's about kind of like an apocalyptic society and he comes down from the moon and he uh, kind of talks about how his perspective changed when he did that. And then I read this article about William Shatner, this like 90 year old, very wealthy actor who went to the moon and came back uh, and felt hopeless and felt kind of disappointed in how we were living and uh, what we were doing. And I thought, well, if this, if this guy who's living this life, um, if he feels this, uh, there are other people who I know who are also feeling this. And um, I kind of wanted to make these pictures that questioned what we were seeing and questioned the reality and this like common way of seeing and hopefully made you engage with them in kind of a longer way and kind of, um, yeah, I kind of question your perspective. Um, and I had, I felt like I personally had a shift in perspective um, through this relationship that I was in where I felt this really intense love that I, I hadn't felt with another person. And I, it really did change the way that I saw myself. It changed the way I saw what I wanted for my future. And, um, and then I went through this equally crazy heartbreak, which um, it, it just made me really think about what I wanted and what I wanted for the future. And um, I was having these conversations and I felt like people both wanted a future, but also felt like there wasn't hope for a future. And I feel um, as if we're confronted very often, almost daily with all of these uh, kind of catastrophic events um, and it kind of led into this environmentalism that I was also thinking through um, and also was, you know, very much on my mind, and I think on a lot of people's minds, where I wanted to talk about our, our relationship with the environment and our relationship with each other and uh, a way that we can change our relationship that will hopefully uh, lead to more of um, more of a, you know, a collective, uh, you know, an idea for the future that we, mm -hmm. you know, that we don't, um, sometimes it feels like we don't have. So I think the prompt of imagining the future is really important uh, for people and also for artists because it is an artist and it is an art um, where, where we have that ability to, to imagine something different and to see things differently and to kind of make people question uh, how they're seeing things. And so all of that was kind of going through my mind when I was making this, this work and talking to people and um, and wanting something more and something new. Um, let's see. And when you say your style changed as you were um, starting or working through this project, can you say more? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Even, um, even kind of baseline, I hadn't been using digital, uh, a digital camera. I was primarily film uh, and I, I was almost, you know, unsure about this digital camera. I was kind of like annoyed at it in some way because I didn't really, I didn't know how, how I wanted to use it. Um, but it allowed for, it allowed for experimentation and for um, kind of this, uh, this way of working where I could do a lot and do a lot and like not worry about the film I was using or the um, like having to develop it, having to scan it. Um, and I was able to, to sort of experiment more. And I felt like that was really helpful with the series because I, I wasn't really at a, at a point where I knew what I wanted. Um, and it also, I mean, compositionally, I was trying to use low light. I was trying to use, um, kind of you know not like in this there's like three separate lighting um uh like lighting uh sorry um the light comes from three separate places and sure. they're all very very low light this is a it was a night photo and I don't I mean it would have been a lot more difficult to make without this like camera that allowed me to do this um and, and a also, flash too. Did you use a flash for some of this work? For some of it, yeah. So I I was using a flash, 
um, from Fuji actually. And it was, it was a pretty small flash, which was very nice to work with. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think mostly just the ability to try different things and um, to have like, for example, two of my friends over and sort of like play around and see what happened um, and kind of make these photos that were coming from ideas and uh, desires and mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, what I liked a lot about this work was that you were dealing with very complex and enormous questions, some of which can be so intimidating about environmental crisis or pandemic or whatever, but the work is actually very subtle and ambiguous and poetic and holds together in a way where the questions um, kind of percolate, but um, without a kind of strong, strong statement about um, global politics or, you know, climate fear. I mean, I feel like you, as you've just said, like the, they evoke a, um, a number of expressions and feelings all, all at once. So. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, that's very nice to hear, because I think that was part, part of it, where I, it was coming from this place of feeling this love and feeling this beauty, and also then feeling this anger, and sort of like questioning what, what it is in that, and, uh, and, you know, how like the beauty is worth fighting for. But also it's like a personal, it's a personal thing. And I think I wanted these photos to resonate differently with different people um, and sort of allow for them to see what they were feeling in them. Definitely. Well, thank you for that. Um, we'll come back to you in just a moment. Um, and I'll now invite Patricia to join us, please. Hey, Brendan. Hey. So can we see you? Hopefully, yes. Yep. Um, Patricia is, by coincidence, um, uh, also um, a, uh, going into her second year at um, the Yale School of Art that coming this fall and has published work in places such as the um, British Journal of Photography. And recently, um, Patricia made a commission for the fiction section of the New Yorker, um, so doing amazing things and Patricia's work um, for this project with Aperture and Fujifilm has to do with the idea of cursed images, which I will say this was a concept that was new to me, but maybe I should spend more time on Twitter, um, partly um, influenced from what I understand by Gia Tolentino's essay in The New Yorker about cursed images, um, which in turn was based on an anonymous feed about um, strange and uncanny images that may frighten us or tell us something um, about the way we live right now with unusual juxtapositions or scenes. Um, so Patricia then made a project um, a little bit about that, but moving on into some other ideas. So do you want to tell us about um, your, oops, just a sec, here we go. Um, yeah, do you want to tell us about your story for um, this commission and maybe a little bit how it relates to your practice generally? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, the the whole idea of uh, sort of creating a story for tomorrow or thinking about um, the idea of tomorrow and waking up and sort of um, not knowing what the day holds or what events are to lie ahead. Um, that's sort of the whole idea that I was really sort of functioning as somebody who was just kind of waking up, making photographs, um, thinking about that uncertainty um, and how I personally navigate and interact with the world around me. Um, often it's kind of chaotic. Um, I seem to always be sort of moving and um, not necessarily finding or having times to sort of slow down. Um, so it was really great um, using this camera because it did allow me to sort of slow down a little bit and to really think about what I was doing because I typically shoot very, uh, very quickly. Um, so it was a little bit of a kind of, uh, I would say, not like a compromise, but um, finagling, I would say, um, where I was sort of managing my my connection to um, the unknown and sort of developing a visual language that really kind of touched upon the supernatural. Um, and for me, that's often a line that that falls really between belief and doubt. Um, so during the time during that time when I was sort of making this work and also being in school, 
Um, I was looking online, like on Instagram, on Tumblr, on the internet, at a lot of um, images that were deemed as cursed by the internet. Um, so I became really fascinated by their construction, their composition, and the authorization of these images. Um, so a lot of times I would just kind of like spiral into this weird internet hole where I would try to find who would who made these images. Um, so that fascination also inspired me to create images that um, were complicated, that um, really challenged, challenged photography's role in cultivating systems of beliefs and seeing. Um, so I became really inspired by, by this kind of way of, of working. Um, and also a lot of times I would kind of construct these images or I would just sort of find these kind of caught in between moments um, uh, where these cl cliches and, um, you know, sort of spirit, spiritish and human realm kind of would come together, uh, if that makes sense. So um, in, in working in this way and in sort of a very kind of responsive, intuitive um, way, um, and also just sort of purely from imagination, um, I was able to kind of like come up with some sort of a response for what the possibility of what tomorrow could look like. Um, and I'm really interested actually in that just sort of idea. So it kind of all sort of blended um, together. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I typically will just go to places and photograph. I'll photograph my partner, my friends, um, and wherever I just feel a sort of sense of, of comfort and uh, inspiration. Um, and you, if I understand correctly, you have a little bit of a background in ghost hunting. Uh, yeah, so uh, strangely, uh, when I was growing up, uh, me and my dad, we used to, he belonged to like this strange ghost hunting group uh, on Long Island. And so um, he would like invite me to come with him and I'm actually still doing it now. Um, but um, it's, it was just a very strange experience and also really interesting um, to just meet people and hear people's stories um, and to just sort of like challenge yourself in a way that really questions your own beliefs and um, yeah, interactions with just other people. Yeah. And had you made work around that theme before this project or was this the moment where it kind of coalesced? Yeah, I mean, I think it really was like this project really kind of, um, I think, led me down to other things as well. Um, and I sort of was returning back to, um, you know, my own beliefs, you know, my beliefs when I was uh, 16 versus now obviously have changed and why have they changed and going back to those moments and really doing a lot of self-examination uh, and probing just to kind of um, pull out some of those ideas or things that uh, are difficult. Did you imagine this body of work would be in black and white from the get-go or was there a little bit of experimentation when you started out? Yeah, I uh, I love black and white. Um, so <laughs> I, um, I know it's really difficult for me to photograph in color, but uh, that's kind of, um, I don't know, I think that's just kind of the style that I've adapted to and I just love and uh, it's hard for me to kind of give it up. Do you shoot on film too? Uh, sometimes, yeah, I, I okay. do digital film, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So um, we'll come back to you in just a moment. Um, thank you for that. And finally, I'll invite Rebecca to join us, please. Hello. Hi. Can you see me? I can see you. Yes, welcome. Rebecca <laughs> um, Tapakian is a photographer um, based in France, currently in Paris um, and studied in Arles, where we met actually many, many years ago, working on the Arles um, Photography Festival um, as art handlers. So a long time coming for a project where we could finally collaborate. Um, Rebecca um, is French Armenian um, and made an intriguing project about her dual identity, um, a conceptual project. And I think one that adds a lot of um, diversity in terms of the approach um, and style within the group of the artists who were part of the um, Fujifilm Aperture Partnership this year. Um, and Rebecca told us before this call that she was on a fishing boat earlier 
today actually making uh, a story for Le Monde. So you can find that hopefully in Le Monde sometime soon. And I hope you'll let us know. Um, Rebecca, could you tell us about how you um, got the idea for this project and specifically this novel um, called Dual Nationality, which as I understand was a great inspiration for you? Yeah, so, well, usually I, I do projects that are in between documentary and fiction and I that I do on many years um, for this project because uh, we have shorter time to make this this project. I decided to work on something I had in mind, but that I wouldn't have alone myself to do normally, which was this project uh, about myself. So I was inspired by this book uh, by Nina Yargekov called uh, in French Double Nationalité, so Dual Nationality, uh, which is a story of a woman who wakes up uh, in the Paris airport with amnesia and she doesn't know who she is. She opens her bag and she sees two passports, two wallets, two phones, uh, two sets of keys. And she wonders who she is. At first, she thinks maybe she's a like, secret agent or maybe like a um, prostitute traveling. And then she decides to investigate about herself. And she follows clues like these objects, um, addresses, emails, uh, everything to get to know about her identity. So I, I followed uh, the idea of this book and even the tone because it's a very funny book. <laughs> um, and I followed this idea to investigate about myself. Um, so for, because people don't know me, uh, the story is that I was born in France. I'm French of Armenian origin. And I wasn't even raised uh, in Armenian culture or Armenian community. I was kind of far from this and then um, discovered uh, my roots were like, I don't know, maybe six years ago or something like this and started going a lot to Armenia. And then Armenia suffered a war in 2020, the Nagorno-Karabakh war. And after that, because my friends uh, went to war, I decided to be there more often. So I um, applied for citizenship, got an apartment in the capital city, um started learning the language all at once um and because i got this uh new identity very quickly uh it was very weird and, um because i didn't grow up with this double identity really i didn't it wasn't natural for me um and i tried to like show this very weird feeling of having two lives two very separate lives um, so I made these self-portraits uh, where I, I am dressing up as myself or possible selves. Um, each of the self-portraits are a bit of me or a bit of what is expected of me. Um, like the one with the traditional dress, for example, um, is a dress that I rented from a dance, like Armenian dancing company. Um, and when I was a kid, whenever I met Armenians, they were, they were all like, oh, you're Armenian, you should learn Armenian traditional dancing. <laughs> and I never wanted. Uh, and I always felt it was pushed upon me, like I had to uh, do like traditional Armenian dancing. So like these are different uh, possible identities. And also in parallel, I... Um, I photographed uh, objects uh, that are that I have at home, so like that show my double life. Um, this picture in particular is uh, in Alfaville, which is a city uh, in Paris region where I live or nearby where I live, uh, and it's kind of a mix of French and Armenian um, because you have this weird, uh, for example, weird names that you find, so Komitas, who is a famous uh, priest and musicologist, but you also have like Ashtarak, which is a, a town in Armenia and has its name in the middle of Paris, like this kind of things. What I liked about these, which were a very late addition to the to this story, was that you kind of found these clues in Paris that showed the Armenian 
presence and if it was like if you know you know I mean if you can if you understand the context and the history then it's is a very resonant corner yeah. and you you also included a few other places that could look banal or just like anywhere else in the city but if you know the context or the sign it says something right yeah <laughs> like this uh, I said Ashtarak, which is like so so random and so funny to see it in the middle of this landscape <laughs> Even the street has a dual identity. Yeah. The project um, started, if I remember from our email exchange, when you uh, mentioned that your uh, dual identity is linked um, in one place, and that is your Instagram handle, and you receive different types of advertising um, sent to you, whether you are in Paris or in Armenia, and that um, told you a lot about what the expectations were upon you as a French person or Armenian person, as a woman, as a young person. Is that right? Yeah, well, um, because uh, Instagram follows you with your um, uh, like address. And so like, it takes a few time, like a few weeks for Instagram to understand where you are and that maybe you're staying somewhere. So it's very funny because um, when I come back to France after Armenia, I receive these ads that want to, uh, that they think I'm an illegal immigrant. Uh, and that I need either uh, administ administrative help to get my papers mm -hmm. or that I would buy fake papers. So I had ads for buying fake papers, like fake passport, fake ID, these kind of things. Uh, on the country, when I'm in Armenia, um, they don't really understand who I am. What, why am I coming to Armenia? Who would do that? <laughs> mm -hmm. That's probably what Instagram thinks. So they, uh, I have these ads for like, um also being uh illegal in armenia so they think mm -hmm. that maybe i'm like a refugee from iran um and then i have um <laughs> sorry there's a cat playing with water <laughs> uh, <laughs> trying to make things full um and then i have um i had this very funny ad for joining the army and uh, it shows like a woman wearing a whip, like having a weapon and everything. And it says, lipsticks don't shoot, uh, arm yourself and get prepared for war. <laughs> wow. It's and very old, it's very confusing. <laughs> yeah. And you represent a little bit that, uh, of that sensibility through pictures of your phone and in other aspects. Um, yeah. Well, fantastic. So um, I think we'll now go to our um everyone can join we'll have a, a round table here um thank you all for introducing your work if you want to come back on line um for any of you out in the audience who has questions please do um, put them in the q a box at the bottom of your screen and we will um get to them in just a moment i wanted to ask um all of you um anyone is welcome to answer and you don't all have to answer it's up to you but um what were what are the um challenges and opportunities for working on a commission in on a short period of time did you learn something about your style did you make a something that you never thought you would have time to make um did did it shift your uh photographic sensibility in, in some way or another yeah if you want to talk about the commission aspect yeah, I think it's uh, it's very interesting and I'm pretty sure everyone will agree. Like usually it takes a long time to make a project, maybe like a few years uh, to work on a project, a proper project. And it was the, the first time I did something that I that I can show, like that I'm, I'm proud of in a very short time. Uh, so you don't have time to be afraid or like thinking, is it really good? Should I do it? Should I not do it? What will people think? Should I write something? Like all these questions that as an artist, you ask yourself, um, you don't have the time, you just act. And it was very refreshing for me to be able to produce something that I'm happy with mm -hmm. uh, in a very short time. Was it similar for you, Ashish? Like you do work on commission and on sometimes I imagine short deadlines with clients and magazines, but was was it different in this scenario where you had to make something that was personal and a little bit more open-ended? I mean, uh, not 
this kind of projects but i mean but i would say i mean it's really good to have a deadline so i mean it, it really helped me and also the whole idea of working with a writer so that aspect also was really helpful to speak to someone and you know talk about the project and go through the nitty gritties of it but i mean the whole idea of of because the the kind of nature of this story i, I generally don't work on this kind of project for a project like this i would i would ideally want to shoot it for 6 months 1 year 2 years and probably forever but so and so and also with you guys around the the fact that there was a deadline i think that was really helpful for me and did you feel and this is for anyone did you feel that um through these projects like extended your style or your way of working or you learned something about um yourself or your yeah your the development of your photographic um sensibility in the process of making this work i mean it, it's sort of a new beginning for me i mean working on a project of this nature and um, the advantage of working in your hometown the people you grew up with your neighbors and you know you being familiar with the language because with portraiture fashion a lot of times you work with people and things that you really don't relate to and by the end of the day you do have to make sense of everything that you're working on so so for me it it was it was one of its kind project and i honestly loved every aspect of it considering how personal this whole project was and also because i mostly shoot on film so the the whole freedom that you get when you shoot on a digital camera and and especially shooting on film in india going to the multiple scanners and then eventually have to send all my film via courier to london and so till the time it doesn't reach london then you always like okay oh my god i hope my film reaches there safely and then then you have to remotely work on your output so having that kind of a freedom was amazing we have one question from the audience so far which is um is there a political thread um that is um noticeable in your work or that you were thinking through and i mean i can kind of see that a little bit in rebecca's work and yours ashish in terms of um questions about migration and immigration but patricia and anabel did were you thinking about any political themes as you were working through um your projects anabel you mentioned you know these kind of massive questions that came to the fore during and after, at toward the end of the pandemic but um yeah the question is are there any political themes however nuanced or subtle in your projects um yeah i mean i think making art and having this a uh, platform for it and like knowing that it's going to be seen and working through it especially at this time i think it's just inherently going to be political um because of just the state of how we're living right now so um yeah i mean i think it's i think that there are political undertones in even just the act of making art and in questioning what's what's happening yeah i mean i would definitely agree i think um you know as an artist you're constantly thinking you're constantly reacting and that in itself is um uh, is a, is a response whether that's political um or not and patricia this is a slight at a slight angle but um do you still follow cursed images or are you like over it after um working through those ideas and and looking at them you know what as inspiration or whatever yeah i mean i think um I mean, I'm looking at so many things right now just because um I, I'm still in school. Um, but the but they do still circulate um in my mind. Sorry, it's a landline. Uh but um yeah, I mean I, I find them interesting. Uh, it's a whole wormhole that you can go down through and um yeah, I mean it's it's still it's still part of it, definitely. Yeah. And I have a question for all of you, which is have any of you printed Uh, this work i mean it's i hadn't really thought about this before we've done 3 years of these commissions and published really fantastic stories online but it occurred to me that i hadn't ever seen any of this work in print and as artists you know after you finish a commission and you you're figuring out how to complete a project whether to go on to another chapter have any of you printed um 
this work and are you yeah well, are you pleased with it how, how do you it does it fit into the other ways that you've printed or shown your work um in previous projects or exhibitions um if i can yeah sure go ahead um, yeah i i printed it uh on my studio and i didn't have time to um, announce it but it's been selected for an exhibition uh in a festival in paris uh in september so it will be printed Fantastic. and uh, framed uh, and everything. So, um, yes, this project is also taking some like materiality on the wall too. That's fantastic. I'm glad to hear it. Anyone else want to talk about printing? Um, yeah, I printed it and I, I try to give it to the people in, in the photos. Um, mm -hmm. And I was working with, uh, you know a lot of friends and and other people and I think uh it's important to see it and to see it with it within a context of other work um and not just within itself so mm -hmm. I mostly print during the time of shortlisting images uh that's when just just to get a look and feel of the images and to just physically hold the pictures and see what you like and what you don't like I mean, however, I mean, this project is definitely a part of my portfolio that I share with other people. So yeah, I'm very happy with it. When you say shortlisting, meaning the edit of pictures that you sent to Aperture or like you made your own um, shortlist before you even sent it to us when we were working on the project together? Yeah, you know, there are like, uh, I mean, when you do a project, there, there's some pictures that you instantly like. So you want to see them. You print them, you put it on your wall, and then you, see, you you look at it for a few days. Do you still like them? Or you don't like them. So I I love that whole practice. So that picture of Lakpati where he has his hands on his head. So I mean, I printed it and I have it on my wall, and like, and I still like it. So yeah. Mm -hmm. And one question for all of you, um, maybe as we um, we come toward the end of our hour together, but um, could you talk a little bit about how you may continue work on the particular theme or even this story in, in the future. I mean, Ashish, we've talked a little bit about you wanting to build this out into a much bigger um, project. And I'm curious to know um, if the opportunity for this commission um, maybe inspired, you know, uh, a deeper engagement um, going into the future. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a really big project. And then, so I, I mean, I recently visited my hometown and I went to the same place. I did make some pictures, uh, but I think I, I am going to take my own sweet time because I literally have to cover the entire state to work on this project and to make justice to the space and the people and the environment. So yes, I'm definitely going to work more on this project and hopefully, it all turns out well, then let's see. Mm -hmm. But also one of one of the aspects that I wanted to talk about is, is the color palette of how I feel like when you see most of the work that comes out of, that came out of India back in the days of everyone who traveled to India, it was either in black and white or it was a color palette, which wasn't really the color palette of India. Either these were like highly saturated images of India and things like that. And my whole reason to shoot on film was just to do justice to that color palette and to make pictures look as real as possible. Because while I was, when I started working with a lot of international clients, I, I felt like they had a different impression of Indian color palette. And I was very happy that while I was working with this, with this camera, I was very much able to achieve the similar color palette the way I wanted to show India. So, which is not just those highly saturated images of Rajasthan or, you know, I mean, India can also be a very muted color palette, mm -hmm. muddy at times or brown or gray. So, yeah. Rebecca, Patricia, Annabelle, are you thinking that you want to extend the work of um, this story into a longer term project? Um, yeah, sure. I, I really want to continue it, um, like including making more self portraits. Um, but also pushing the research, like uh, these clues that I was talking about. For example, I've been thinking of uh, hiring, I don't know how you say in English, the people who study your 
handwriting and would say like graphologist about, i think Maybe. yeah that yeah that like tell, talks about your personality uh based on your handwriting uh that's something i was thinking because it's two alphabets so i have two handwritings but i, I was thinking also to like really pushing this project to um other research like not only the, the self-portraits and the objects but um this investigation going like further and annabella pictures would you like to add anything there um yeah I, I definitely think um i would like to revisit this and build upon it um some more um there are definitely parts of it that still feel um a bit unfinished and just sort of kind of working more i think with the camera um is something that i would like to work on uh, a little bit more um and just kind of teasing out a few more concepts, I think, is is something that's definitely on my mind. Um, yeah. Yeah, the project felt very open ended, which was uh, kind of something I was grateful for. Uh, Aperture allowing us to to do the work we wanted to do, and um, it felt yeah, it feels more like a, a elongated conversation, probably. Mm -hmm. So um, there's one. Last question, which is um, each of these stories includes not only your photographs, but also essays um, by really fantastic writers and curators who we commissioned and who worked with you on framing um, your project. I, what was that like for you and um, how dependent was the story on the text or do you feel that um, you learned something through the process of reading about your, your work when it was published on Aperture or working um with a writer to kind of express yourself so yeah if you can talk a little bit about the text element to um this project that would be great maybe we could start with you um rebecca because you were working about with a text from the beginning but also you worked with a novelist yelena moscovich yeah. who um wrote about your um work for aperture well, it was really great to read her text and see my projects through her like words and her vision because I'm so used to like when I talk about my work, it's I'm very factual, I'm very pragmatic. I just usually very short too. <laughs> and then seeing someone uh, writing about it in such a, uh, I mean, uh, metaphorical way or like, uh, imaginary way and also I read her book because we met uh in Paris and then she gave, gave me her book I read her book and I can I could recognize um like something similar uh in her way of writing that I had in my way of photography mm -hmm. also because of uh, her uh, having this uh, double culture too like another double culture but uh being and and her characters uh in her books uh, are also uh, having these uh, uh, double identities and it was so interesting to um, see yeah how she she saw my project and and how, how mm -hmm. she wrote that. I agree would anyone else like to add about the text or Um, I felt like it was a great experience working with a writer. Uh, it was pretty seamless too because it came out of a conversation that I had. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if this was the same experience, but I, it was, came out of a you know a kind of open-ended conversation, and it felt really nice to read what someone else had to write about the work and not really feel like you had to defend it so much, but just seeing someone else's perspective based on what you said and that was a new experience for me and that was um it was very it was really uh one of the parts about this project that I really enjoyed um it's been such a, a pleasure to work with all four of you uh your projects are so fantastic and unique and it's gratifying to hear that um you want to continue working to build out um, these ideas into um, future projects, um, photographic essays, books, hopefully exhibitions. 
Um, thank you so much for your work. For everyone out there in the audience, um, the photo essays, the photographs, and the text are all available at aperture.org. We encourage you to sign up for Aperture's mailing list and stay tuned to our upcoming programs, um, book releases, and other events with Aperture. And um, thank you, all four of you. It's been a pleasure um, speaking with you and looking forward to seeing where you go next with all of your wonderful um, artistic projects. So thanks again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you, Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye.